Have you ever wondered some of the things that Mormons teach and how you can share the gospel with them? And the Southern Baptist Convention President J.D. Greer endorses heretic Christine Kane. Stay with us as we look at these and other stories on the 511 News. Now, there are two kinds of people in the world, only two kinds, not black and white, not rich and poor. There are those who are dead in sin, and there are those who are dead to sin. After three nights of unbridled lawlessness across London, the contagion is spreading. The problem is that God has already judged this. He has judged murder already. I don't need to question it. I don't need to ask and wonder what his plan is. We're commanded as Christians not to participate in the works of darkness, but expose them. Welcome back to the 511 News. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, I thought it'd be awesome to talk about some applicable, I guess, studies or a teaching concerning how we share the gospel with Mormons. Now, I want to talk about that because that recently took place in Texas. As many of you guys know, we went down there with a team of 18, actually, to go on the streets sharing the gospel and to do a two-day conference there in San Antonio, Bulverde, Texas. And what's cool is is it's kind of laid the groundwork for what we're going to be doing there in March. We are excited, hopefully, Lord willing, to be a part of a giant conference that we might be on, and I won't announce that until we get the official confirmation on that, and also do some filming with Joe in El Paso, and also a three-day, I believe, conference that we're going to do on our own concerning some of the new material that we have coming out. So we're excited about that, and I do hope that that kind of laid the groundwork. I broke up some follow ground, and then Joe can do some seeding and some watering, and hopefully the Lord will cause some great growth for people to come to salvation. But it was awesome. We have a ton of people now involved already at the home fellowship group that we started there in Texas. And it, we've had nothing but awesome things uh, being told to us that are going on there. And I want to talk about that because we did end up talking with a number of Mormons because there were about 40 of them outside of the Alamo. And if you guys didn't know this, and I don't know if you guys are on Uh, Facebook groups like I am, but I'm on a ton of Christian Facebook groups. And if you haven't noticed, they've been enamored by Mormons who want to have quote unquote Bible study with people on these Christian groups. So I've noticed that, that that's what's been going on while they haven't been allowed because remember they are dictated by the prophets and the Latter-day Saint church tells them exactly what church they're allowed to go to in terms of the area and region that they're from. They tell them exactly what they're allowed to believe. So They also are the ones that told them what kind of mission they could still be doing, and they were not allowed on the streets going door to door. So this was the first time I had seen any uh, out and about recently, and it was a group of, like I said, about 40 people about 40 Mormon guys, and I have terrible vision, so I couldn't tell if they were just cowboys dressed in uh, white shirts, <laughs> but uh, apparently, no, they were not. I mean, I guess maybe some of them could have been, and uh, they walked over to us, and funny enough, they usually go in groups of two. In this instance, they were in groups of three, and the two that they were with, and we didn't find out until having multiple discussions there with our mission team as different groups began sharing with them that they were in groups of three because the two that were going to be going out were being led by a leader. And those two were literally their first day. In fact, the first day, first people that they were talking to out on their quote unquote mission was us. (laughs) And it was cool how the Lord worked that out. And I want to go over some of the things that I like to ask. I think there are some some pitfalls people can fall into when sharing the gospel. I think there are some times that we can get off pace and off course when it comes to how we share and the important things that we bring up, keeping things to the gospel-centered message. Uh, And so I do want to talk about that. But before we get into that and I get into more doctrinal discussion and and quoting uh, many different Mormon teachers and some of the doctrines that they hold to, I wanted to talk about this recent endorsement and why it is a big deal. And a lot of you guys have known that we've talked a lot on here concerning the current president of the Southern 
Baptist Convention. If you guys don't know, the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Christian denomination in the world, I believe. And so it is important to recognize what's going on because they have a giant, I mean, guys, a giant following, a giant amount of people who adhere to the SBC. So when the president of the SBC does things that are unbecoming of a true follower of Christ, we need to call it out. We need to mark it, especially when it seems to be the narrative from Mr. J.D. Greer concerning not only some of his endorsements, but some of the things that have happened under his watch. For example, them voting in critical race theory as a tool to be used in the church, something that is culturally Marxist, something that is anti-Christ, anti-biblical at its core, and allowing this to be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention and even voting it on the floor to accept this As an analytical tool, absolutely that is dangerous. I think that should have made everybody that had any understanding of what critical race theory is, who James Cone is. And I mean, there's there's somebody... There's a lot of people that we could point to that, that do some great information concerning that. But it is a it is a major major concern when J.D. Greer says that the Bible whispers concerning homosexuality. Uh, when in fact uh, there was no whispering going on on Sodom and Gomorrah uh, when that took place and the commentary on the book of Jude that says this is an example of those who go and seek after strange flesh of the eternal destiny of souls that would do such a thing. So we recognize that's not much of a whisper there. The Bible isn't whispering there. When J.D. Greer that is also is taught on podcasts that Acts 17 gives us a license to therefore call people by their preferred pronoun, I think that is absolutely preposterous. What Acts 17 should do is give you a license to call all men unto repentance, as it says in Acts 17. Uh, that God overlooked certain sins, right? God overlooked sins, but he now calls all men everywhere to repent. So some of these things are obviously quite dangerous. And then to see... On October 14th, his endorsement of a heretic. You can't get around it. That's exactly what Christine Kane is. Christine Kane is a heretic. And I'm looking at a picture right now. And I can have Tony, I'll probably end up somehow putting this in the description or on Facebook so you guys can see. It's a picture of a sit down with three women. One being Christine Kane, the other being Beth Moore, who we have an entire teaching called Beth Moore is Dangerous, and that's with good reason. And remember, J.D. Greer also said that's the kind of person we want teaching after John MacArthur had made the statement that she needs to go home because she started teaching men and not just women at Bible studies. Um, And then also Joyce Meyer, another word of faith heretic. So you have this going on. Christine Kane is, if you go to Hillsong... Hillsong's website, Christine Kane, is listed as a contributor for the website. Not only that, if you went to Bethel, uh, Bethel Music's Worship You, their their YouTube channel that has over 118,000 subscribers, you can see a teaching by Christine Kane on there with Bethel with over 730,000 views called Anointing Versus Gifting. So yes, Christine Kane not only teams up with, but is a word of faith heretic. And this is somebody who J.D. Greer on Twitter said, is quoting her from her new book, says, There is no one-size-fits-all approach to disciple-making, but there is one call for all disciple of Jesus. If you really want to change the world, this book is for you, at Christine Kane. Purchase your copy today. And... I I really, really have a struggle with this, that he would pull out and post and tweet the quote from a heretic, from somebody who teams up with Bethel for a contribute for Hillsong. And the fact that he's doing this shows that he lacks all discernment. It is still up, even though he's been called out multiple times on his Twitter feed by people in the Southern Baptist Convention saying, hey, what are you doing What are you doing here? This is dangerous. You are pushing people to false teachers. It's really, really dangerous for that to be taking place. And so we need to recognize it and see that she has pushed things like the new age. 
Um, you know, we need to recognize she pushes the word of faith teaching. I mean, guys, this is no joke. This is serious stuff. And to have the president of the SBC endorsing this, I think in all honesty, at this point, with all the things I've already listed concerning J.D. Greer, I don't think that we could call him a, a, a sound teacher of biblical doctrine and truth with all the things that he has said and done and the way he has led the SBC. And I think it's really dangerous. And and if you're a part of the SBC and we have a lot of brothers in Christ who are, you need to ask yourself, what is going on there? What is happening? By what authority is all this taking place? Because it's not the scriptural authority um, that we should have. And it's really, really dangerous. So I wanted to put that out there. I wanted to, to, to put out that warning because that's what's going on, guys. And so when you have the leader of the biggest Christian denomination, at least in America, I'll have to double check on the in the world thing, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, and you have the leader of that pushing false teachers, pushing false doctrine as well, saying that God whispers when it comes to sexual sin and things like that. We need to mark that. And, and this is causing division. If you're in the SBC, I hope you're getting ready to vote him out before you're going to have to vote yourself out of the SBC because it is getting to a place where it's really dangerous to be a part of that movement. So with all that, I want to get into a few of the teachings of Mormons, of the Latter-day Saint Church, of what they believe. And I want to do this kind of quickly and concisely and kind of just share with you how I like to, I guess they say keep the main thing the main thing, but I, I think in all honesty, there are a number of ways you can share the gospel with a Mormon who is lost, which they are if they're in the Mormon uh, church. So I want to be able to talk about these things, and hopefully what you can do is take some of the quotations that I'll give you here and just, you know, write them down, have them in your notes, and have them ready. I'll tell you this. When I first came to Christ, and a lot of you guys know that I came to Christ through the DVD, They Sold Their Souls to Rock and Roll, and then began coming to fellowship here at Blessed Oak Chapel in Simi Valley, California, and began being discipled by Pastor Joe and began going out and sharing the gospel in the streets. But immediately after I came to Christ, and I, I will say immediately, I had Mormons knocking on my door. And what that started was about, I would say, a six-month process of the same um, Mormon young man and uh, two men coming and sitting outside of at my table out front of my parents' house and discussing the doctrines of Mormonism and why I believe they were false. And we would go over a lot of things, and it was really cool because it became a place of growth for me as a believer because you need to know what your doctrine teaches in the Christian church. You need to know what the Bible actually teaches, and you need to know why these cults and why they are false. Remember, and I, this is going to come up uh, very quickly when we start discussing their teachings, remember that when we read the book of Galatians, the letter to the Galatian churches, so there would have probably been multiple letters that were sent out the same letter, but to multiple churches in the area of Galatia, we read that Paul was sharing with them the true gospel of Jesus Christ and that somebody came in after and did what we call plus religion. Now, what we believe uh, as biblical Christians, when somebody adds plus religion, what they do is they negate the gospel. And we believe that because that's what the scriptures teach. And so Paul had come shared the gospel. He explained to them what it was, what they were coming a part of when they became one with Christ, as he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, which is one of my favorite texts in all of scripture, that he himself had died, that it's no longer him who lives, but Christ who lives in him because he was crucified with Christ. I love that scripture. And it comes on the back of him rebuking Peter the same person who he uses as his credential for having a proper gospel. I just love this, okay? I absolutely love Galatians and that that book. And I encourage you, if you just read the first two chapters today, I think you could benefit a ton with your walk with Christ today. But 
Nonetheless, just remember that what has happened is that Paul has shared the gospel, the gospel that was given to him. He was called as an apostle, not by man, but by God himself came to him miraculously in the person of Jesus Christ, came to him miraculously on the road to Emmaus. And so what we have is not only his calling being of the miraculous, but then he says, I preach this gospel and I checked it out with the very apostles with the ones you've heard about, right? He checked it out and made sure that what he was preaching was true. And he says the these words, they added nothing. But what was going on there to the churches in Galatia, not just one church, but to multiple churches, was after Paul had left, they had come in and preached, yes, you need faith in Jesus. Yes, you need all this. All you need to do is add circumcision. So they were adding something to something to the gospel. And what does Paul say? It is no gospel at all. And if you have a Book of Mormon, and I do, I have a few copies, it will say right on them, right on there, another testament, or what is testament? What's a synonym for? Covenant, another covenant of Jesus Christ. So we know first and foremost, there is no other covenant, okay? We are in the covenant that we are supposed to have in Christ. Now, All of that is to say that they have been taught and teach a false gospel. It's not just, hey, there are brothers in in Christ as well. They just believe something a little different. They just add something little. Paul said that's no gospel at all when you start adding. And he said if even an angel comes and preaches another gospel, let him be anathema, accursed. So we need to recognize this. And that was a question that was happening. And we're in another election cycle. But that was a question that happened over and over when it came to Mitt Romney, when he was running, and whether or not Mitt Romney was a brother in Christ. And sadly, people like Glenn Beck as well. I saw a lot of people fall for Glenn Beck. Was He's a brother in Christ. He just happens to be a Mormon. And this stuff is really dangerous. He did, led a ton of events with Christian speakers where, hey, you know, we're all one. He also would meet with John Hagee over there. We were just in San Antonio, Texas, and get some of his information out there and make his help get his name big. And guys, the, none of this is by accident. And so we need to recognize that they are different gospel messages. That's the first thing we as Christians need to recognize. And so typically what I will ask if, and and I've, I've already been rambling a little bit here, so I'll try to do this as concise as possible because I do have some good quotes um, because sadly this day and age, the quote unquote elders that are not too elderly <laughs> that they send out they all uh, seem to be very ignorant of a lot of the doctrines and how they've come together, especially when it comes to the Journal of Discourses. Now, if you didn't know, when it comes to the Book of Mormon, there is not a lot of doctrine in there. The Book of Mormon is fairy tale stories is the best way I could describe it if you have not read it. Um, but I, is, I will point to specific text And like I said, I like to keep the main thing, the main thing when I can. Absolutely. Right. We could point out very, very easily that there are no, there was no Egyptian written text by Hebrews in, in Egypt. Okay. The Hebrews would not have written their religious texts in Egyptian like in First Nephi 1, that it tells us that's what took place in uh, Mormon 9, 32 and 34, that the language is a reformed Egyptian language, one that just doesn't exist ever in history. Okay, we could look to and tell you that supposedly these tablets that were seen by others, um, it's really, really, really clear that even the people that quote unquote saw Joseph Smith see these tablets that he translated from reformed Egyptian, a language that the Hebrews would have never, never, the, the language doesn't exist, but even if they were going to write religious texts, they would have never written in Egyptian, their slave owners. Okay. They would have written in Hebrew. So we could point those things out. We could show very clearly, this is just ridiculous. Even the people who, um, even the people who saw supposedly these texts, it's admitted they a lot of them don't even believe at the end. In fact, Brigham Young says that they were taken away by Satan so that these ones who supposedly saw the text don't even believe anymore. All right. These were the ones who were supposedly by Joseph Smith's side as witnesses. 
But I do believe some of this stuff can be side issues. I, I know that sounds, you know, hey, we can get into these and talk and, and hear, but they're dealing with feelings and we need to try to get them back to some objectivity. And so I typically will go the route of asking them, do they believe what Second Timothy 3.16 says? Or I'll ask them specifically, what is the gospel? In fact, the last guy I asked of that, when I asked the three young men, I said, hey, what's the gospel? And they were very silent and said, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> and I said, what? What do you What do you mean that's the gospel? I was like, what, what chapter and verse is that? Uh, I was like, well, Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I, you know, so we'll start with there and I'll say, this is what the gospel is supposed to be that it's very, very clear. But what I will do is take them, like I said, to second Timothy three, verse 16. And I'll ask them, do you believe this word right here? That every single scripture is theonoustos. It's God breathed. He's the one who put it down onto paper. do you believe that? that it's used for correction, for training and reproof, right? So man of God may be rightly equipped for every good work. Do you believe that? And if they say yes, we have some sort of starting point. Because then I can ask them, okay, I was like, do you believe in the law of non-contradiction? The law of non-contradiction is very, very clear. You, You have to make sure that these two points that I'm about to make to you, that they do not contradict each other. And so what I will typically do is take them through... Second Nephi 25, 23 very clearly says you're saved by grace through faith after all you can do. Remember Galatians was written because Paul had given them a gospel and they said, yeah, we believe all that plus circumcision. So now what we have here is you're saved by grace through faith after all we can do. What we have over here in the Bible is you are saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God and not by works, lest any man should boast. So what we have here is something, like I said, the law of non-contradiction, basically what takes place is these are contradictory statements. You see, both could be false. Both could be false. Both cannot be true. One could be false and one could be true, but both cannot be true. So once we understand that, we recognize that one of these are telling the truth. If we truly believe the word of God for what it is, one of these is telling the truth. And we could go through that and talk about that. And I'll say why I believe the scriptures and why I believe what the Bible teaches. You can ask them a question. This is something we ask a lot to Catholics as well who believe you need to be baptized to be saved. Is I have a knife in my back. I have 60 seconds to live. What must I do to be saved? And just rambling off the craziest things (laughs) people could ramble off in that time. And typically, if they answer truthfully, it goes back to a simple faith in Jesus Christ because that's really what it is. So then I ask them, what good is the Book of Mormon? What good are the teachings of Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and every president, every prophet of the Mormon church, what good is it? Because you find out it's absolutely positively useless. And in fact, when it comes to the gospel, it's harmful and it's dangerous. You see, because Joseph Smith was a boastful, boastful man. In fact, in the history of the church, volume six, page 405, 408 through 409, he said this, quote, God is, is in the still small voice, in all these affidavits, indictments, in all of the devil, all corruption. Come on, ye perse- prosecutors, ye false swearers, all hell boil over, ye burning mountains, roll down your lava, for I will come out on the top at last. He died, by the way, shot dead <laughs> in Carthage. I have more to boast of than any, uh, than any ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. That's Joseph Smith, better than Jesus. 
I guess he did believe that Jesus came to him and when he was a young boy or God, yes, God and Jesus came to him as a young boy and said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Yes, of Joseph Smith. Um, then we could talk about the Adam God doctrine. This is from Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, volume six, page three. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves. Jesus said that God is spirit, by the way. In all the person, image, and very form as a man, it is necessary that we should understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so. For I am going to tell you how God came to be God. Just by definition, that's ridiculous. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and I will take away and do away the veil so that you may see and that he was once a man like us. Yeah, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. Now, that's not it. It continues. This is from volume one, page 50 of once again, Brigham Young. Yes, BYU, Brigham Young University. Now hear it, O inhabitants of earth, Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner. When our father Adam came into the garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body. Our father Adam, I'll keep going, and brought Eve, one of his wives with him. He helped to make and organize this world. Yes, they don't believe that God spoke things into existence ex nihilo they believe that god just played with matter he is michael the archangel yes adam is also michael the archangel the ancient of days about whom holy men have written and spoken he is our father and our god and the only god with whom we have to do adam is the father is the god that's what they believe. In fact, there's another writing. I don't have time to read it because I want to show you just how racist and disgusting their quote unquote prophet was. But President Heber C. Kimball on June 29th of, of 1856 also preached the same exact doctrine and that he learned that God, uh, that God only is for us. That's the only God he is. He's the God of us, but that he's kind of an ignorant God that didn't understand there were other gods. But I wanted to quote this because if you guys didn't understand how racist and disgusting Brigham Young was, I have to read this and also remember that the statute he's going to say here is to always be so. So here's what he says in volume 10, page 110. Here is the racist Brigham Young. Here is the prophet who, when he was saying this, they believe he was speaking as if God was speaking himself. Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. Mormonism is wrong because their prophets are false, racist, disgusting human beings. Mormonism is wrong because it contradicts scripture. Mormonism is wrong because it adds to the gospel. Mormonism is wrong because Joseph Smith is a false prophet who made false prophecies. And also Mormonism is wrong quite simply because it gets Jesus wrong, the God of the Bible, creation in every aspect. And if you love the Mormon riding his bike down his street, down the street. If you love the person who is going door to door in, in these foreign lands in order to share this, we should love them enough to share this truth. I know I said that a lot of that fast and we'll probably have to do a follow-up episode, not if not next week, the week after or something, where we can get a little deeper in this. But I, I encourage you guys, go back, listen to this, share these truths with them, but sharing share it to them in love. And just as it says in Colossians chapter four, we speak with grace as though seasoned with salt so that we would know how to answer each person. The 511 News with Chad Davidson has been brought to you by Good Fight Ministries, bringing you news and commentary from a Christian perspective. This show can be heard every Friday wherever podcast shows are available or visit 511news.org. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to being with you next week on the 511 News.